Okay, this is the audio review for Building and Breaching Reality by Jody O'Brien. Okay, so interaction routines. Um, these can be analyzed as stories that have an organizational logic and provide scripts that define the situation and identities appropriate to the situation. <clears throat> so we're socialized to learn these scripts, which, you know, type of things are supposed to happen in what type of situations. And to illuminate this, Jody uses the idea of genres, um, such as those in literature, right, to show her point. So within genres, there's expectations about characters and storylines and associated behaviors and feelings that are taken for granted as part of the genre. So stories in the romance genre are going to be about love. And they make their way into our lives and reflect cultural assumptions, such as that of getting married. So she talks about how if a person is of a marriageable age but is not married, they're considered weird. And they have to justify this social transgression. But some explanations are more socially palatable than others. Like being a priest or a nun as a reason for not being married when you're a marriageable age. Versus saying you just don't believe in the institution of marriage or that it doesn't interest you. So, you know, going back to the genres. In the horror genre, we expect madness and murder and mayhem, right? There's certain expectations and different um, interaction routines. So when people feel compelled to go along with a cultural practice or provide a reasonable explanation for variations, you can tell the practice is normative or compulsory, such as being married, right, or being employed. People disregard or reinterpret contradictory evidence and behave in a way that results in self-fulfilling prophecies. So as humans, we're meaning makers. We create theories to interpret our experiences and often have a working theory of what's going on. So we don't just assign meanings to situations. The meanings hold an underlying logic and coherency. So a friend who's always late, as an example, you might have a working theory to apply when they're late. They may later apologize for their lateness, which reinforces your general working theory about them being late. But if you have a whole group of people who are supposed to be somewhere, and none of them show up, and later you run into one of them and they act like nothing happened, you become confused, and you try to develop a working theory as to why. Like, oh, maybe my friends are jerks, or they just don't like me, or whatever it might be, right? Or I just had one of these incidents, uh, a friend of mine, for his birthday, he told us all that dinner was at 7, when it was at 7.30, because we're all terrible, and we always show up late. So we actually, I showed up 15 minutes early, turns out. So anyway, um, all human interaction is grounded in storylines. So, you know, for what is going on and those underlying theories that we have for making sense of the things when they don't go as expected. So an unquestioned assumption in a lot of our greeting rituals with each other is that people can see and hear each other. So when someone doesn't respond to a statement directed at them, it affects our working theory. So we'll often think they're a jerk who's ignoring us before we get to the possibility that maybe they can't hear us. So for deaf people, they report that it's common for people to be frustrated because of their error once they realize the other person is deaf, like they didn't understand that in their interaction, and they take out that frustration on the person. So one feature of socially constructed realities is that we have working theories that enable us to generate a lot of explanations for situations that don't make sense to us. So these theories are the products of our social interactions. And we have a lot of background expectations that become a feature of our socially constructed realities because they contain a great deal of information that everyone quote unquote just knows, right? Or what we call common sense, which is a set of shared cultural rules or background expectations for making sense of the social world and the rules that are part of that are part of our cultural knowledge, right? Which is why it's shown to be something that's just obviously true. So The Social Construction Reality is a title of a book by Berger and Luckman um, that describes the ways that people try to create organizing systems with the intent of making their lives orderly and predictable. But the funny part is, is that once we create those predictable outcomes, um, they become our common sense beliefs. We forget we ever created them. We think that they just are inherently true. So um, when it comes to ethnomethodology, this is a research area in sociology that explores folk methods that people use to construct systems of meaning and reality. So they make visible the often invisible or unseen ways that reality is constructed. So reality is reflexive as it contains unquestioned beliefs that we can't really prove wrong. 
and realities often contain contradictions and inconsistencies. So they contain a series of working theories about how to deal with contradictory information, which we call secondary elaborations. When we encounter information that contradicts our assumptions, we explain them away, right? We explain the contradictions as a secondary elaboration. So we'll get some examples of that. So first you have David, David Rosenham, who had a hypothesis that psychiatrists are all so entrenched in diagnosing patients that they would assume anyone who comes in for treatment to their facility is insane. So he sent several students to a psychiatric admitting room and told them to say they were hearing voices, but not to act abnormal in any other way. And all ended up being judged a need for hospitalization as the staff assumed they were insane because they're operating in a certain context, right? And the context they're operating in is where they assume patients are insane. So the second feature of reality is that it has an order and a structure to it. It's coherent and it comes out of the human need to make order out of chaos. So non-contingent just means that there's no connection between an outcome and something else in the environment. So a lot of our understandings have contingencies like if you drink too much alcohol, you're going to have a hangover, which most of you probably don't even really know what that means yet because you're not over 30 and you haven't had the experience of like what a real hangover feels like. But <laughs> the idea is that's a contingency. We know, you know, the one thing's causing the other. Or if you want to get into grad school, you need to have good grades. But, you know, non-contingencies are just when um, there's not a connection between an outcome and something else in the environment. So... When um, doing non-contingency experiments, this reveals some interesting things about the construction of coherency because we develop superstitious or neurotic theories and we're able to create coherent theories out of even the most random of information, right? We, we take these things in and we apply them, you know, with, with the selective observation that we have, we try to make sense of what we're seeing, even if they're not even connected. So realities may seem strange to outsiders, but they're plausible and normal to insiders. So this shows how, you know, our interactions are pretty fragile. The process of creating and maintaining reality is ongoing and obviously interactional as we do it through our interactions with each other. So realities are based on these ongoing interactions and they're at risk of performance breakdowns in pretty much every one of these interactions. So this shows how reality is fragile because it relies upon performing these expected roles and routines that make up and constitute what we consider our cultural stories. So cultural realities break down, but we do a lot of work in our day-to-day -day social interactions to repair the disruptions, especially through what we talked about before, tact, right? Um, we learn to act like everything's normal. So breaching is an interesting part of this. So Garfinkel did these social breaching experiments. They took place at UCLA in the 60s. So breaching itself just involves making the underlying structure of reality explicit by acting in a manner that's inconsistent with the taken for granted rules of interaction. You know, there's a lot of those rules that maintain our reality. So Garfinkel says that we enter into interactional moments trusting that other people share our explanations and definitions of reality. So this trust helps us engage in stable, coherent, and meaningful interactions. Um, but when those breaches come along, again, we tend to explain them away um, so they don't become part of our reality. So when you're confronted by a breach, um, people first try to ignore it, or what he calls the nothing usual, um, nothing unusual bias. Um, and the second way that people try to deal with a breach is to look at other people, right? They'll kind of like look around at others and be like, this is weird, right? You think this is also weird? To kind of see what's going on, see what other people react to. And the third is to treat it like it's a joke. So in all of those ways, you're trying to restore the expected reality. So Garfinkel did these social breaching experiments where he had his students, first he instructed them, do not let other people push away these breaches, right? Do not let them joke, ignore, or explain away the breaches. So um, <laughs> one of the experiments, students um, went in uh, shopping, right? Uh, students took items out of other people's grocery carts, which of course challenges the taken for granted assumption that when you put an item in your cart, it's yours. Typically, the way someone would smooth over an interaction like that, or like a com complication in that interaction, would be to say like, oh, I'm sorry, I thought that was my cart, right? Which excuses the error. But in the experiment, they said, uh, oh, I took it out of your cart because it was easier to reach than the stuff on the shelf. <laughs> so of course, this causes a, a breach because 
it's so hard to explain things like if a person doesn't understand the basic context of the reality that you're supposed to be operating in in a grocery store, meaning what's in my cart is my stuff, then it's hard to explain that to them without either getting frustrated, angry, or just kind of being patronizing, I guess. Um, because, you know, we're supposed to operate in a context where we have a shared reality. So another... Um, Another experiment was at McDonald's. They had He had other students that breached first by ordering a Whopper, which is clearly a Burger King item, um, kind of going against the taken for granted assumptions. Like most people, not just in the US, but around the world, um, know what items are sold at McDonald's, right? It's it, They've spent a lot of money making that possible. So um, after the whole Whopper incident, the employee tries to be like, what? You know, right? And trying to explain it away. And then the next student, goes up to the counter and asks for a slice of pizza, <laughs> right? So it's through these breaches that we see the taken for granted assumptions that underlie those specific interactions. So reality is also permeable because we're constantly moving between different realities. So we alter our attitudes to bring them in line with the expectations of the reality of that moment. So war can be a tragic example of this reality shifting. So for soldiers, their reality from safe to conflict can flip at any moment. And they have to shift between those they're allowed to kill and those who killing them would be murder. So this ideology is super fragile. This is why we see so many veterans facing PTSD and other psychological issues as they try to transition back to the social reality of home. And they have to wrestle with their minds and spirits that were broken through that shifting reality process. Okay, so Rosenthal and Jacobson wanted to study the effects of preconceived beliefs about intelligence on the performance of school children. So to do this, they um, did research studies with teachers where they told some teachers that their students were gifted and that others in their class had the capacity to improve significantly. And what they found in their results was that the teachers who were told that their students would improve or were gifted, those students were academically more successful. And this suggests that student performance is shaped in part by the way teachers treat students. So in that way, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you think the student is gifted, then you treat them that way, they actually end up doing better. So self-fulfilling prophecy is just an event that becomes true because we act in a way that brings about our initial expectations. So when it comes to self-fulfilling prophecies and interactional expectations, we can be told we're capable of great things and we're very smart, right? And if we have the opportunities and resources, we can succeed. But the opposite is also true. You can get stuck in a negative mental loop where negative experiences trigger a set of negative expectations, and the result is that you end up expecting negative outcomes from many situations. So when it comes to self-fulfilling prophecies and stereotypes, Mark Snyder looked at the relationship between stereotypes and attractiveness, noting that his research participants thought that attractive people were more friendly but he observed that we're more likely or we're much more likely to treat attractive people as if they're friendly and outgoing, right? Just like how some of those teachers treated those gifted students as if they were gifted or likely to improve. So, you know, that we treat attractive people as if they're more friendly and outgoing, and that gives them more opportunities to act friendly and outgoing. Um, and then on to when looking at prejudice and employment, right, and stereotypes in that context, there's this issue where employers prefer to hire people that are most like themselves because they feel a connection to them. So this social connectivity often falls along economic, gender, and racial lines, right? As well as a lot of other categories in that kind of intersectional way. Even when people don't consider themselves to be prejudiced, they tend to prefer people within those categories, right? So white employers are often ill at ease in the presence of racial minorities, which obviously affects job interviews and the likelihood of being hired for racial minorities, right? So even in people that don't consider themselves to be prejudiced, it's just the way that they've been socialized to interact differently. So Carol Word examined uh, non-verbal behavior of employers in job interviews. So, you know, if you've been in a job interview, you know that you're often trying to desperately read the cues of those people interviewing you to see if you're doing well or not. I remember I had a job interview once um, where I had two people on this panel and one of them, she's nodding and smiling and agreeing and I'm like, okay, I'm doing well with her. And the other dude sat there like the angriest statue I've ever seen. Um, 
And I pretty much knew when I walked out, like, well, I'm not getting that job just because that guy, like, I don't, like, I don't know if I, like, ran over his cat before I got to the interview or, like, what's going on, but, like, he just was not having it, right? And I could tell that by his face, by his posture, by the way he didn't ask follow-up questions, those kind of things, right? So Carol Word examined nonverbal behavior of employers in job interviews, and she was looking at, at certain positive factors, such as leaning in, nodding, smiling in affirmation. Her hypothesis was that seeing those subtle behaviors of confidence gives more confidence to the applicant who's seen as performing better in the interview when they're expected to do better, right? So when the white applicant is saying something and you're nodding and, and like, hmm, mm-hmm, you know, making affirmative noises or things like that, that's going to give them more confidence and then it's going to seem as if they did better in the interview. It's more so because you're telling them they did better as they're doing it, which is going to make people feel more you know, at ease and be better in that presentation of self, right? So obviously this affected um, those minority candidates for those applicate or for those um, jobs because they um, they were not given those same kind of nonverbal cues. So they weren't, um, they didn't feel as comfortable in those interactions. So they weren't rated as doing as well within the interview. So it's through ongoing interactions that we reinforce our belief systems and bring in our preconceived notions and stereotypes, which are very powerful in that process. Because whenever we have these conflicts or contradictions, we use our secondary elaborations to explain away any of those things we see, those, those deviations. And that just reinforces our stereotypes. So the status quo becomes preserved even by those who don't agree with it. So when it comes to the social construction of the status quo, our cultural institutions are the well-established cultural practices that have widely recognized authority. So they're basically what constitutes the status quo. So they go into medicalization as part of this, um, you know, and I, I've used a bunch of these examples in here, um, that the medical profession is one of the least questioned institutions. They are relatively undisputed source of authority, right, regarding what constitutes acceptable behavior. So this form of knowledge says that certain actions or feelings are natural and, you know, any sort of, um, you know, derivation or any sort of change from that pattern is considered to be pathological. So Conrad and Snyder were writing about medicalization of behavior and medicalization in their terms is just referring to the behaviors that have been defined as a medical problem or illness. So the medical profession, again, provides some sort of treatment for it because it's considered an illness. So they were looking at um, hyperkinesis or, you know, nowadays we, we all know ADD, ADHD, all those kind of things. Though they were doing this research, um, I believe in like the early 90s or late 80s, somewhere in there, um, where that term wasn't quite in vogue. But this is basically the same concept that um, hyperactivity in children, right? They were saying that it's more of a social issue than a medical issue. Um, like a medical issue has physiological symptoms like a cough or a virus or something like that, right? But they argue that the high diagnosis of hyperkinesis is really more a reflection of a social problem, right? We want kids to sit still and be quiet. But that doesn't mean that that's actually what they do. That, that kind of goes against their physiology, <laughs> right? Um, and they argue that it's not necessarily an individual behavioral disorder. Um, it may be the way that we educate kids that's the problem, right? It might be um, sitting them down for eight hours a day and expecting them to be silent and calm and somehow reflective like adults are, um, not letting them get out their energy, working out their energy, those kind of things, might lead to hyperkinesis, the fact that we have such sedentary lifestyles now, right? Um, that maybe this hyperactivity is less about the kids being wrong and more about the adults wanting to have control over these kids, which is, you know, not just impractical, but just kind of illogical. They're kids. They have a ton of energy, right? Um, that they run around. That's what they do. So when it comes to medicalization of deviant behaviors, all cultures have some sort of, you know, um, what they consider crazy or mad, right? But the interpretations differ based on the culture. So some people they they're medicalized so they have to seek medical treatment while other cultures see it as like a spiritual thing right or maybe being being able to see between worlds or things like that when it comes to asocial conduct um social psychological alternatives to the medical model of madness is that you know sometimes people that are gifted or geniuses often have a hard time meeting the standard expectations for behavior 
because their creativity manifests as a resistance to socialization, right? As those with interpersonal skills and material resources can avoid the medical labeling and they can become significant contributors like artists, right? But sometimes those who are medicalized and labeled are just seen as not as valuable and their insights are taken into consideration. So an example of this could be, um, there's this video I was going to include about this woman who um, has, like she's on the autism spectrum and she is also a very wealthy, very successful um, developer of cattle ranches. It's kind of complicated, but basically the concept is, is that um, because she is autistic, she approaches things and looks at the world differently, right? She doesn't have the same kind of taken for granted notions. Part of um, any of those autism spectrum disorders is really just kind of a breakdown in social communication. Um, so people tend to seem a bit off. And so um, part of this is just not being able to read the social cues correctly. So in her case, um, she's creative. She just sees the world a little bit differently. So what she ended up doing with her profession as a cattle rancher is that she, um, you know, like when developing like the how slaughterhouses work, what she basically did was she would literally get on all fours and walk through the pens as if she were a cow. Meaning she did something that none of the other cattle rancher people would do because she has a different perspective on this. So she literally would put herself in the shoes of these cattle, I mean, other than being slaughtered. And that's how she determined, like, what improvements needed to be made to make the process more effective and also less cruel for the animals that are being butchered. Um, so, again, that just kind of shows how... Um, you know, in our culture, we tend to medicalize people in those situations and see them as a problem, see them as someone who needs to take medication or, you know, as pathologically wrong. But in her case, she's turned it into a multi-million dollar business, um, largely because she approaches it differently than people that are better socialized, right? Um, and drippetomania, oh, this one is so gross and wrong, but it's such a great example of the extreme effects of medicalization, right? Because... Medicalization has a lot to do with the ideals of the time period, right? So at certain times we see things as medical disorders versus nowadays we would clearly not see this as a medical disorder, right? So it, it was supposedly a medical disease among slaves who would run away from plantations, right? Meaning because the social understanding of the time was that slavery was a good thing if you were enslaved, right? Of course not for the enslaved, but the idea that white people told themselves <laughs> to make themselves feel okay with such a horribly exploitive system was to say like, no, this is good for people, right? It's good for everybody. And so this was literally documented in a medical journal in 1851, some sort of mania that causes people to run away from plantations. And you're like, no, I think that's the horrible oppressive system of slavery that makes them run away. Not some sort of like specific pathological condition within an individual, right? Any of us, if we were enslaved, would want to get the hell away from that. So, but it does show how the ideology of the time period that said like, no, it's a good thing and people want to be enslaved and all of this kind of crap um, made its way into the pathologizing and medical diagnosis, right? Um, and we still, the same continues today with pathologi uh, pathologizing uh, same-sex desire. Like homosexuality was considered a mental disorder in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the, the DSM, that um, psychologists use until the 70s. Right? And the transgender community is still being medicalized, right? Um, there's these, like, gender dysphoria that they say people have. Or, um, you know, we see it in the Trump administration trying to adjust the definition of sex in order to erase the existence of trans people in legislation in our modern day. So we often think of science as neutral. But science is also based on preconceived notions and assumptions, meaning the time period, the history, the cultural values make their way into the science. So that nature v. nurture false debate, that came about, you know, though in reality, it's interconnected, obviously. It's not nature or nurture. It's both, right? And epigenetics is demonstrating this in our recent years, right? That an individual's environment affects what genes are turned on and which are turned off. And this connects to the social construction of sex as binary, right? When in reality, it's much more complex. There's actually like five biological sexes. So it's important to note how these kind of debates come about only because of the social understandings of the time period. So media is another cultural institution that has tremendous power to define situations, 
and to provide cultural narratives without scrutiny, which has a lot to do with the political economy of the media, right? Where media industries, because they need money to operate, um, they're very reliant on advertisers. And so that means that that's going to affect the kind of content that they're putting out as the content has to reflect the wishes of the advertisers. So they might not be critical of certain things because advertisers don't want them to be, or they might promote certain cultural messages because that's what advertisers want them to promote, right? So I um, also included a little video in here I'm going to show you um, about manufacturing consent. This is uh, Chomsky and Herman's um, you know, book from the 80s that basically really um, you know, has a place in my heart that talks about how the media system itself is a system and that it does its job of preserving the status quo through not challenging those those dominant narratives through you know reinforcing power hierarchies through um, basically what he, what they call manufacturing consent is the idea that we don't all agree about this these kind of notions right we don't all agree that transgender people should be wiped out of existence etc right but because if that's what the narrative becomes in the media landscape that becomes the reality that then gets reinforced over and over and this is kind of uh, such a great example of how those interactions work to create meaning because that's what media does right especially advertising advertising sends us thousands of messages every year and those messages accumulate into affecting our mental realities of what we think is okay right like advertising literally creates needs out of nothing by attacking you by attacking the social reality saying you're ugly right? You got to buy all this stuff so you'll stop being ugly or you're not loved. You got to buy all this stuff so you can be loved or whatever it might be, right? So I'm going to show you this clip that kind of explains um, at least some of the, the five main points about uh, manufacturing consent. Beep, beep, beep. Propaganda. Many use the word when talking about countries like North Korea, Kazakhstan, Iran. Countries viewed as authoritarian through the lens of the Western media. Press freedom, freedom of thought. People use those terms when talking about countries like the United States, France, Australia, democracies. In 1988, Noam Chomsky co-authored a book with Edward Herman called Manufacturing Consent. It blasted apart the notion that media acts as a check on political power, that media inform the public, serve the public, so that we can better engage in the political process. In fact, media manufacture our consent. They tell us what those in power need them to tell us so we can fall in line. Democracy is staged with the help of media that work as propaganda machines. Media operate through five filters. The first has to do with ownership. Mass media firms are big corporations. Often they're part of even bigger conglomerates. Their end game, profit. And so it's in their interests to push for whatever guarantees that profit. Critical journalism takes second place to the needs and interests of the corporation. The second filter exposes the real role of advertising. Media costs a lot more than consumers will ever pay. So who fills the gap? Advertisers. And what are the advertisers paying for? Audiences. And so it isn't so much that the media are selling you a product, their output. They're also selling advertisers a product, you. How does the establishment manage the media? That's the third filter. Yee. Journalism cannot be a check on power because the very system encourages complicity. Hey. 
governments, corporations, big institutions know how to play the media game. They know how to influence the news narrative. They feed media scoops, official accounts, interviews with the experts. They make themselves crucial to the process of journalism. So those in power and those who report on them are in bed with each other. If you want to challenge power, you'll be pushed to the margins. Your name won't be down. You won't be getting in. You've lost your access. You've lost the story. When the media, journalists, whistleblowers, sources, stray away from the consensus, they get flat. That's the fourth filter. When the story is inconvenient for the powers that be, you'll see the flat machine in action, discrediting sources, trashing stories, and diverting the conversation. To manufacture consent, you need an enemy, a target. That common enemy is the fifth filter. Communism, wow. terrorists, wow. immigrants, Whoa. a common enemy. A boogeyman to fear helps corral public opinion. Five filters, one big media theory. Consent is being manufactured all around you, all the time. And so, you know, differences and in inequalities our prevailing feature of most cultures, but how they're con or how they're constructed often differs by culture, right? So in the U.S., we stratify in a lot of different ways um, by race, class, gender, sexuality, age, ability, religion, et cetera, et cetera. But we maintain these social hierarchies when we explain them away, when we make them normal, when we basically make them the baseline assumptions. So contradictions and transgressions show us where the boundaries are. And wrestling with these contradictions is the dynamic force of ourself and our society. So culture production is a dialectical process that, you know, basically defines um, the way that we interact with groups in society. So people struggle over what different meanings, you know, or what symbols mean and who has the authority to project public definitions. So those cultural institutions we talked about um, are a resource in these struggles, you know, especially family, government the economy, religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, they can wield great influence in the creation or maintenance of socially shared definitions. So when it comes to hegemonic practices of inequality, they persist because people play out the scripts that are expected of them. If we challenge those things and were aware of them and stopped performing them, they would also change. So Prevailing, a prevailing reality suggests certain actions and not others. So change has to be performed on a social stage for it to actually change. So the social construction reality is probably the most central topic of the whole textbook. And the construction of it goes against our notions of some outside objective reality. But if we look at other cultures, right, this anthropological view, if we compare cultures, we can see how radically different their beliefs about what is real is, right? So the created realities are just the product of relationships, communities, groups, institutions, and the entire culture, right? Those values. So it is much easier to see anthropologically than sociologically, um, as again, they're taken for granted notions. So if we're in that culture, we accept them as normalcy, and we don't question their logic. But if we enter a different culture, we don't have the same taken for granted notions. To us, those things seem alien or strange. 